How you doing? Yeah, good. Thanks. Mind if I uh, grab the classifieds there? Sure. Looking for a job? Yeah. I'm trying to see if uh, there's any uh, local auditions. My uh, high school drama teacher said I have a lot of promise. You know anyone who gives uh, acting lessons in the area? No, I don't. Oh. All right. Thought you might. Hey, hey, I'm Keith, and today I'm going to show you how I built this octagonal garden bench with the help of my buddy Jason from Bourbon Moth Woodworking for some random guy who lent me the classified section. Here's how we did it. Bourbon Moth arrived right on time, and we immediately got to work discussing the SketchUp drawing he had come up with. If you look here, it's this wide and that wide, and you go around the tree, and yeah, that should do it. Now, truth be told, Jason was the lead on this project, and when he called and asked if he could fly out and we build it together in my shop, my immediate reaction was, sorry, dude, that sounds pretty lame. But upon further consideration, I said, giddy up, book your plane ticket, and I'll pick you up at the airport. He immediately proved his worth with his exceptional math skills. Ten of them in one? Yeah. Nice. nice. No, that's not right. I was like, 108, 18, <laughs> total. No, that's not right. <laughs> We wasted no time getting to work first by cutting all of our seat slats to rough length. The bottom seat slats are made of 1x4 material and the back seat slats are made of 1x4 as well as 1x6 material. So we cut everything, labeled it, bundled it, and cradled it lovingly. And here Jason learns very quickly the beauty of working in a small shop like mine. Put this over here, nope, there's nothing there. I'm just gonna leave it over there. So the 2x6 material is for our leg frames as well as our seat frames. And look, we still have a big pile in our way. Yes, yes we do. Jason also learned how fun it is to have two cats running around the shop at all times, even though he's allergic to cats and had to pop Zyrtec like Tic Tacs every day. Next, we could take our leg template, which I had cut on a CNC by my buddy Mike at Veteran Woodco, and lay it out on our two by six to maximize the material usage. Jerry was having a good time as well. While Jason was doing that, I was building a jig so we could flush trim all of these legs on the router table. When you're building a piece of furniture like this, whether it's indoor or outdoor, that requires a multitude of identical parts, jigs are your friend. This one was pretty simple, just some blocks glued down on a piece of plywood with some toggle clamps, but I needed it to be able to flush trim both sides of the leg without any major adjustments. So as you can see here, I'll make the first pass on this side, and then it's just a matter of unclamping the toggle clamps, moving it to the other side, and adjusting these little ratchet clamps. The key here is to never have to take the template off of the part. Always keep it clamped in one way or another. Now Jason was kind enough to help out and flush cut a few pieces. However, apparently this was too slow of an operation for the Mothman and he got quite bored and decided to take a nap. But being the hospitable person I am, got him a nice pillow of microfiber cloths and went back to work. And he picked the wrong time to nap because that's gonna do it for us on day one. Day two started by flushing up the ends, the top and the bottom, of each leg to their correct angle. I wasn't super comfortable with that operation on the router table with our template being that it was end grain and all. And as you can see, Jason and I were getting along swimmingly at this point. Our friendship blossoming exponentially, minute by minute. Then we headed over to the joiner to joint all of our 2 by material into a nice, crisp, clean square reference edge to rip all of our parts down for our seat frames as well as the other parts for our legs. They are inch and three quarters square. I left them a little bit strong so that we could run them all through the thickness planer to make sure they're exactly the same. Before we started batching out all of our leg parts and seat frame parts we wanted to do a little bit of a dry fit assembly so I cut a couple pieces to length and Jason here 
went to work. And that right there is our basic leg frame assembly. We're going to need eight of those. With the stamp of approval on that, we cut all our parts to length and then screwed a bunch of pieces of plywood into my new bench top to create a jig for cutting all the domino slots for our four leg assembly parts. As Jason demonstrates here, we can do our back leg and front leg at once and then swap those out for the top and bottom stretcher and do those both sides by sliding back and forth like so and plunge for our dominoes. So this jig took us about four or five hours to make, but totally worth it. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Cut that on camera. <laughs> yeah, you can think it wasn't on when you did that. Circumcised. <laughs> Luckily, I wasn't singing tenor after that near disaster, and we could get to work plunging for all of our dominoes. So in order to create a double stack domino like we had without adjusting the fence, what we did was we plunged the bottom and then raised it up with a 5 eighths of an inch plywood spacer, and it ended up working perfectly. Then we could do a quick dry fit and make sure that all of our dominoes were actually in the correct position. And which, as luck would have it, they appeared to be. And for some reason, we looked like we were just given an achievement award for doing nothing but putting four pieces of wood together. And one by one, we dry fit them all and then gave them a rigorous test run. Yeah. <laughs> The whole thing just collapsed. <laughs> <laughs> I knew we should have glued them up first. <laughs> Being that this is outdoor furniture, we are using Total Boat Thickened Epoxy. The beauty of this, number one, is the open time, its ability to withstand the elements, but it is nice and thick so you don't get that runny, thin epoxy everywhere. It is an absolute delight. Unfortunately, we only had one tube and UPS let us down, so we had to go to the thin, runny epoxy later on in the project. Once we had some epoxy in there, we clamped them up and set them off to the side to dry and cure overnight. Total boat, baby. Jason showing that you should never hand them your newborn baby. Day three. First thing to do was to get all the leg assemblies out of the clamps and sand them all smooth. All right, see you on the other side. And while Jason sanded his life away, I started working on all the little parts for the seat assembly. All of them, except for that middle stretcher, have a 22 and a half degree angle cut on the ends. Now the front stretcher is a little bit wider than the sides. It is three and a half inches tall. See, this is where our fishing really kicks in with two people. Yeah. Right. I feel like half the clips, it's you doing stuff and me just like handing it. <laughs> well, it certainly does make it easier for me. Now, to cut all the domino slots for these leg frame assemblies, we are employing the use of this domino dock provided by our friend Ramon Valdez, who makes these docks for the 700 as well as the 500. See link below. We also devised this little clamping assembly that screws onto the base plate of the domino and allows each piece to be held firmly. I don't know how many times in a video I'll cut the music to me sneezing. sneezing? Yeah. Really? <laughs> Just cut the music and go ahead. <laughs> you need your headphones or are you good? No, good. <laughs> All right, so you're going to go <laughs> hand it to me. So the process for this was pretty simple. I would mortise out the top slot with the domino, hand it off to him, and he would mortise the bottom, and then you would just get in a rhythm. Sometimes you lose the beat, though. And once all those were cut, we could dry fit. How far off are we? Like, off. What the hell is going on here? <laughs> Why would, that doesn't make any sense. Because well, there were different spacing from the ends. This is what happens when you drill out a couple hundred domino holes in 12 minutes. Truth be told, we did have to make some parts over due to poor layout. I just transferred the lines on the wrong sides of the work pieces. Please make note of the clamping blocks that Jason peppered these things with so we get nice even clamping pressure. They are affixed using CA glue and my favorite green tape. My boy's wicked smart. Oh, 
Do, do not, do not. The math says it will, but the wood says it won't. <laughs> <laughs> the math says yes, the wood says no. <laughs>Pretty stressless. We just needed a couple clamps, top and bottom, and then Jason came up with these little calls to push everything out and flush. It's pretty crucial to make sure the outside edges of those angles all line up. Then we had to mix more epoxy. <laughs> this video is in no way sponsored by Total Boat. Total Boat, baby. You gotta seal the end grain of those dominoes. Things never gonna stay together, man. <laughs> Total boat, baby. Oh, perfect. Yes. Yes. Check that epoxy. Is it tacked up now? Has <laughs> it been eight minutes? Yep. It's done. Oh god, it's freaking hot. We have. Ah! Ah! I was the one slinging this domino all day while you're sitting there with it stuck in a stand, just <laughs> push it down. <laughs> day four. Started with taking those seat assemblies out of the clamps and sanding everything nice and smooth. A little tip here is you clamp on another piece to make sure that that sander can't round over those edges. Then it was reckoning time. Did all of our measuring and cutting and sanding and gluing all work out the way it should? The only way to tell was to do a full dry assembly. Now we didn't glue that last seat assembly together just in case we needed to make an adjustment and we did. It was about an eighth of an inch shy. So we made a new front apron about an eighth of an inch longer and then glued that up. Oh hey, did you know that Jason and I are also on a podcast called the Shop Sounds Podcast? It includes myself, Jason, and our buddy Nick Key from Key Woodworks. It's a woodworking podcast about nothing. Check the link below, subscribe, and tell us what you think. We now return to our regularly scheduled program. Now, if we look at the SketchUp drawing, you can see there's a shelf that goes around the top to kind of hide all the end grain on all those joints. So we grab some one by six, cut all those at 22 and a half degrees, did that, and then went inside and kind of laid them around just to make sure everything fit and was in the right place and we had a good overhang. And then, being thoroughly exhausted, retired to the couch. Day five. First order of business was to do the joinery for that top octagonal shelf. So I'm using a mix of the domino as well as the Zeta P2. So what this allows us to do is put our dominoes and glue and then clamp it all together with a twist of an Allen key so we don't have to try to get clamping pressure around the entire octagon. And this will be extremely useful on install day when we attach the two halves together. Okay, what we've done, and we've spared you the process of milling all this, is cut the lumber for our back frame assembly. So this is all milled down to one inch thick and it will be these frame assemblies which will have the back vertical slats attached to them. How about that glare? It's nice. So over at the table saw we beveled the blade to 10 degrees for the top pieces and the other ones were cut at 22 and a half for the sides. But before cutting all of our parts to size, we did a little rough mock-up with some CA glue to make sure it fit. And plop, plop, fizz, fizz, oh, what a relief it is, it fit. And then we bashed it apart. Then it was just a matter of batching out parts again and labeling everything. Because these ones got a little bit confusing, especially when laying them out and plunging for dominoes. They kind of look the same. And that 10 degree bevel across the top rail kind of throws you off. Although Jason's handwriting still makes it quite difficult to distinguish which piece is which. With all of our parts cut, it was back into production mode. Well, first we needed to make or figure out. Yeah, that goes, yeah, that goes there. Okay, we got it. I told you it was a little confusing. Then it was production mode. While Jason cut the domino slots, I sanded all the dominoes so they weren't as tight and then dry assembled each one until the very last came together and of course stacked neatly on the table saw where they don't belong. 
Then it was time to show our maturity level by blowing up gloves into cow udders. Remember earlier how I said we only had one tube of the Thixo thick epoxy? Well, here we are with the old traditional thin stuff. Now, Jason devised these little angled clamping blocks. I told you my boy's wicked smart. And these blocks proved to be indispensable as these frames cut at different angles get quite slippery, like trying to put a belt around an eel. Watch out now. And they worked like a charm. And then we figured while we had the epoxy out, we may as well glue up the octagonal shelf for the top. Now we did not glue those last two seams. We left them unglued so we could assemble and glue them on site. Day six. Well, today Bourbon Moth and I went our separate ways. While he stayed back at the shop, sanding and routing and sanding and chiseling epoxy. Bourbon Moth. Are you talking to me? I kept my eye on him through my home security camera. Bourbon Moth. What? <laughs> I don't think he was nearly as amused as I was, but he soldiered on and epoxied all the end grain areas of the bench to prevent any moisture from wicking up. So while Jason was taking care of that, I was over at my buddy Mike's shop at Veteran Woodco utilizing his CNC. Now this garden bench is a gift, a 17th year anniversary gift from Neil to David. So he asked if we could somehow include somewhere the number 17. And we came up with using Roman numerals XVII, and it just happened to work out perfectly since that's four numbers and the top has eight panels and went every other panel. And while this thing was sucked down to the vacuum table, it was the perfect opportunity to run a bit all the way around the inside to give us a nice round circle that would wrap around the tree. Perfect. After riding my trusty steed, AKA my Honda Civic, back to the shop, I was able to get to work on the angled template for the left and right back slat. I know it doesn't look tapered, but it is tapered at 10 degrees. Now the way this is gonna work is with my template, I'm using double-sided tape to stick down onto a piece of wood and then using my L fence, I just run that along there. There you have a tapered back slat at 10 degrees with a 22 and a half degree bevel up the side. And like an otter cracks open a clam, I can pop that off, remove the aggressive tape. And there's one left side tapered slat. And while I continued on with the other seven left slats, Jason was rounding over the corners on the octagonal shelf and then putting a round over on that and then sanding it smooth. And while that was happening, I finished up my left slats and moved on to my right, which was just a matter of flipping this template over. So I didn't need to make a new template for the other side, rip off the tape, and there we go, eight of each. Then we could do a dry assembly to make sure everything fits using quarter inch spacers. Now the two center slats are just ripped to width. There is no taper on those. And by golly, it worked. And with confirmation that everything fit, we could start putting an eighth of an inch round over on all the parts, sanding all the faces, and making sure there are no sharp edges anywhere. And as you can see, I strategically left Jason with the hand sanding while I took the power sander. And done. Day seven. Now is the moment of truth where we could dry assemble everything back together, make sure everything fits, and then mark for our bolts. We will be using six inch galvanized bolts that are half inch diameter. So we mark out all of our lines. We will be using two bolts to join each section together. And then we have to go through and square them all down so we can take them to the drill press and drill all those holes. You can certainly do this with a drill, but the drill press ensures accuracy and that they are and that they are actually all straight. And apparently the sweet sound of that rigid drill press gave Jason some dance fever. And apparently it was contagious. And if you're looking to build a bench like this of your own, plans are available. Please check the description below for the link, fully dimensioned drawings, cut lists, etc. And with our bolts all tightened down, we can start laying down the decking. We countersunk and pre-drilled every hole before driving in the stainless steel inch and five eighths of an inch long screws. We don't want to risk any splitting or breaking off any heads of screws. So with the first set on one seat, we could then work off of that using quarter inch spacers and moving to the left. 
going off our center line on the front of the leg and the back of the leg, we were able to draw a straight line front to back as our reference and then cut all the pieces to size. Everything is at 22 and a half degrees, but that last piece needed to be notched around the leg. So I used a combination of the miter saw and the bandsaw. These could absolutely both be cut on the bandsaw. I just like that cleaner cut of the miter saw. Meanwhile, Jason was watching his own Instagram stories, it appears. And that's actually where we decided to end it for day seven. Day eight, final day of building. And we picked up right where we left off with the seat slats, marking out all the positions for the screws for pre-drilling. It takes a little extra time, but it looks so much better when everything is in the exact same position on every piece. And Jason and I's OCD wouldn't allow it any other way. Then we could route all the pieces with that eighth of an inch round over, sand everything smooth, get rid of those pencil lines, and then install. So again, these are inch and five eighths stainless steel screws. Yeah, baby. And then just like before in production mode, we kind of got in a groove. One was pre-drilling, one was screwing. But that last screw, folks, that last one, we did together. Because nothing says friendship like driving a stainless steel screw. Then it was time to pop in all those back seat frames. Unfortunately for Jason, he drew the short straw and had to jump in the cage. So these we put in with stainless steel screws as well. These also needed to be pre-drilled, countersunk, and driven home. Oh yeah, that Sapili was smoking. I fit! You made it! <laughs> One more bagel, and you weren't making it. Uh, that cheeseburger almost did me. Oh gosh, more pre-drilling. This was to attach the octagonal shelf from below. Pre-drill, countersink, just like before. And then you get a stack of slats, you get a stack of slats, you are denied. Jerry, is that yours? Can I have that back? No? Fair enough. Then it was time to attach our vertical back slats. We found it was easiest to kind of get them all in place with spacers, clamp them down, screw each corner to hold it in place, and then pre-drill and screw the rest of the holes. These were all laid out with the exact same screw spacing as the ones below, so everything looked uniform and consistent. And each slat was given a quarter inch spacer in between to make sure that none of that shifted while we were pre-drilling and screwing them down. And then it was groove time. I drilled, he screwed, I drilled, he screwed, I... That... Don't... Please don't clip that. And alas, a few hours later, we finally made it around to our last four slats and got those secured. Jason hopped in the cauldron and secured the top shelf with our pre-drilled holes. And just as quickly as everything got together, it was time to take it apart for transport. So the easiest way to transport the bench as well as reassemble it back on site was to break it into two large sections and take those two sections in between those two large sections, which included the seat assembly and the back slat assembly, and those could all be connected again when this wraps around the tree. And then it was finally time to extract it from my dining room and load it into the van, make sure it gets a good night's sleep overnight, and prep for delivery in the morning. Day nine, final install. And in case you were wondering, we are not putting any finish on this Sapili mahogany. It will weather nicely outside. It's rot resistant, weather resistant, and will turn a nice silvery gray over the years. Dude. What? Are you worried? Dude, that ain't making it. As you could hear in my voice there, there was a bit of a freak out moment going on that this was not going to fit. Now you're probably wondering, did he even measure this thing? Yes, I did go on site a month earlier and take all measurements. It was just a little difficult because of the way the tree jutted out at the bottom with the root structure. In hindsight, I should have found a way to template it. 
After consulting an arborist, we bought some tools in case we needed to make any alterations to the tree or the bench. Luckily, Jason found this little root on the bottom that said remove if necessary. So that's what we did. We pulled it off and magically that was what was holding the entire bench up from fitting together. We also used some small concrete pavers to level everything. With our two large sections roughly in place, we could start piecing the smaller deck sections back in and bolting them down, one side in, and then the last side to complete the circle slash octagon. Then we could drop on the octagonal shelf, get that into place, epoxy the joints. Now this breed of maple tree grows about one inch every hundred years, so we have a couple of centuries before it starts to encroach on our upper shelf. And then using an Allen key to tighten those Clamex connectors, we are good to go. And then we could reattach all the back slats and get this thing ready for its final unveiling. Yeah, come on out. Oh, my gosh, that is so cool. And this is it, so, this is like way fancier than anything I've right. ever had. It's great. It fits it perfectly around the tree. Yeah, we didn't now, have to modify it at all. That's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Not at all. It's it's amazing so when you take weird. accurate measurements. Yeah. Things kind of just happen. It's so beautiful. But now this feels like an actual room. Like with, with the use of this bench now, you want to come out here and read the paper or like just sit and chill. Wow. I have to say that I am extremely proud of what Jason and I were able to accomplish on this project, and it is without a doubt the coolest project that I've ever been involved with. What an experience working with Jason for nine days and sharing so much shop time and so many laughs and building such a special gift for a class act like Neil Patrick Harris and his husband David Burka. And thank you all so much for watching and sharing some of the experience with us. And you must go and watch Jason's version of this build on his YouTube channel. And make sure you subscribe over there if you're not already. I'll put a link to his channel on screen at Bourbon Moth Woodworking.